it work on a product called Skylight. Um, and Skylight is a profiler for Rails applications. And it's a really fun product to work on because I get to do the thing that I love the most, which is figuring out how things work. So I really love building things. I love writing code and building new things out of nothing. But I also really love breaking things and understanding how things work. Um, and I, because I work on Skylight, I get to understand a lot about how little parts of an application work. Um, and I've realized that one of the best ways to understand how things that are complicated really function under the hood is by breaking it down into its simplest parts. And I'm going to attempt to do that with one of the hardest problems in computer science, um, and actually just in general, which I've learned is time. Turns out, time is a very hard problem. Maybe one of the hardest ones that we have to solve in our roles, in our jobs, but also just as a society and in humanity in general. Um, we all agree on a time. We agree on a date. We agree on the hour of the day. And it can seem pretty simple. We've all come to this agreement that it is this hour and this time and this minute and this second. And it's a simple thing, but have you ever thought, have you ever really considered how on earth we agreed on it? How did we come to decide that we are all going to adhere to the same time? Well, it's a very good question. And I think in order to answer it, you need to do a little bit of a history lesson. Um, so. We're going to start this morning with a very, very brief lesson on the history of telling time. I love stories, so this is going to be probably the fastest story covering the most amount of years that I have ever told, but I'm going to try to do it as quickly as possible. So the earliest instances of how human beings told what time it was was through something called a sundial. And the ancient Egyptians actually were the first ones to use sundials. They created sundials to divide a day into smaller parts. And the first sundials date back to around uh, 1500 BC. And this is an example of that. And what they actually did was they would divide the waking, the daylight hours of a day, between sunrise and sunset, into 12 parts. And the sundial would indicate the time by casting a shadow onto a surface. You've probably seen sundials um, you know, in parks and in various places, but this is where this idea actually came from. And from the Egyptians, the Greeks actually refined the sundial and continued to use it, and then the Romans built on that same idea centuries later. However, even though all of these civilizations used sundials, there was one major problem, which was, of course, how do you tell the time at night? <laughs> There's no sun. So I guess you just don't care about the time until the sun comes up? Seems probably kind of limiting. So there was a new solution that came around called something that was called a water clock. And a water clock was one of the first ways that human beings actually were able to decouple telling time from the sun. And it's unclear based on my research where exactly water clocks came from. Some people say that um, it originated with the Greeks, others say it was with the Romans, but basically it seems like a lot of different civilizations around the world were using these. So a water clock is basically a vessel and has sloping sides and it allows water to drip at a constant rate. And because the water drips at a constant rate, it becomes very easy to predict how much water will drip at a certain amount of time. And it was kind of like a makeshift clock. Um, apparently, ancient Egyptian priests would use water clocks to perform um, rituals and rites in their temples, even at night. Another similar solution to the water clock is something called the incense clock. And it's unclear if this came about in India or China, because they found evidence of this in excavation sites in both locations. But the idea is basically that an incense clock is a very elegant but incredibly simple solution to keeping track of the time without any regards to the weather at all. Um, when 
you use an incense clock, you basically leverage the idea that incense sticks can burn at a regular amount of time. And so when a certain amount of incense would burn, there would be these strings that were attached and a little heavy weight. Um, and you can kind of see a picture of that here. Um, and when the incense would burn, the weight would drop and it would drop and make a sound, and so if it was very consistent, everybody could tell, oh, this much time has passed. And there was a similar story, too, with uh, candle clocks, where you could tell how much time had passed based on the consistent amount of a candle that had burned away. It was only centuries later that we start seeing something called the hourglass, and this is something we still use today. Sometimes like you'll see it in like board games, um, but this was one of the earliest reliable ways of telling the time. And the reason that the hourglass kind of changed the way we told time is because it was pretty uh, reliable. In fact, the hourglass is what was used by sailors out at sea, and they would be able to use the hourglass even though the motion of the boat would rock around because it was using sand and the consistent a rate at which the sand would fall through the hourglass. And they were first used back in the 11th century, and it was truly the first time that there were reliable, accurate, and reusable ways of telling time. So, where did the mechanical clocks that you and I use come from? Well, that didn't even appear until the Renaissance. So this is about like 1600s. Initially, it started with a swinging pendulum clock, but eventually, the mechanical, cl mechanical clock was implemented using the vibrations of a quartz crystal. And this made for even more accurate time telling than the hourglass. Quartz clocks were actually used by the National Bureau of Standards from 1929 until 1960. And that was finally when we as a society switched to atomic clocks. Atomic clocks was about the time when we finally came up with an official definition for a second, which means before that year, before 1967, no one really had a concrete definition for what a second actually was, which is kind of amazing if you think about it. It's a pretty recent thing. As it turns out, a second, one single second, is 19,192,631,000 and 770 hundred cycles of the radiation of a single atom of an element called cesium. It's a very big number to read, but that's actually how many times that atom um, is funneled through a tube and passes through a certain amount of radio waves. And that's actually the definition for atomic time, which is the time that you and I use today. Okay, that was my very brief history. Yes, thank you. I appreciate whoever clapped. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'll have you know, if you look up any of these, like the Wikipedia article is pages long, and I was like, okay, I have to pick like the most important thing out of this. So I'm sure there's somebody who like spent seven years writing a PhD dissertation on one of these, and I just did it in like two minutes. So I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm not at all. Um, be delivering your work. I just don't have enough time, ironically. Um, so, all right, okay. We have figured out how we've gotten to the point of telling time, but that only answers half of the question. Sure, you know what time it is, but how do you and I agree on what time it is? That's like a big fundamental thing for all of us to agree that we are all gonna use the same time. In order to answer that question, we need to go back to a certain interesting creation called the Great American Railroad. So when the, the US railway system was created, when it was initially introduced, there was no concept of like a shared time. There was no standard time. Actually, each town had its own time, which meant that it could be 10.04 in one town, and then a few you know, miles away, it could be 10.15, and then the neighboring town could be 10.30, and every time you go to a new town, you're like, I don't know what time it is, I guess I have to figure it out, even though you're not actually changing your distance all that much. And this system actually worked okay until the use of trains. 
you might be able to imagine why this would be problematic. Uh, with every town operating on its own version of time, it became very hard for train conductors to operate on any kind of schedule. Also, without a kind of standardized train schedule, there was a very high risk of accidents and collisions because everybody was just running on their own time. So in 1883, the US government instituted something called standard time zones to help solve this problem. And the time zones of the 1800s looked a little bit different than the time zones that the US currently has today. And time zones might seem like a pretty, you know, obvious thing to us now, but it was a very new idea at the time. In fact, these towns and the American public were so resistant to this idea of standard time that most towns and cities operated with two different times. And in their railway stations, they would have two clocks. They would have like the town time and then the rail time. And this went on for a long time, almost 40 years, until the US government was like, okay, this needs to be law. <laughs> we're gonna make a law and we're gonna pass something called the Standard Time Act in, in the year 1918 and that finally enforced everyone to adhere to standardized time zones. In fact, the US was actually not unique in how they solved this problem. Back in the year 1840, Great Britain solved it with the establishment of standardized time zones for the Great Western Railway. And they termed their standard time zone around a town in Gre called Greenwich. And that's why they came up with the term Greenwich Mean Time. And we didn't actually start adopting standard time zones across the world until the year 1900. That was when we finally began to operate with this idea of a universal 24-hour day that had a certain offset from Greenwich Mean Time. So these are the international time zones that we all use today and have to deal with whenever we take long flights, which is the worst. Um, but there is a reason. So next time you take a flight, remember that. But as you can see, that this is all incredibly complicated problems that are hard to solve and even harder to get people to agree to use. And in software, if we start looking at the relationships between the time zones and how we all agreed to a certain time and how we deal with time in our code and in our systems, we'll start to see that there's a lot of interlinking and similarities between these two examples. In software, time presents other challenges, but they're not that different than what challenges human beings have had to deal with throughout the course of history. And we have our own versions of these problems. And I, can, I can't think of anywhere that this is really more evident than within distributed systems. So, a distributed system, if you're not too familiar with it, is basically a network of processes. And you can kind of think of it as a, as a graph data structure um, where the nodes are the processes and the edges between them are communication channels. And one of the most famous examples of a distributed system, and the one that I'm also gonna use, is the ticket booking system. So when I uh, had to book my ticket to come here, I basically was part of a distributed system. I was utilizing a distributed system. So in this example, there are three main processes. My server, the server for a, the third party service that I'm booking with, which my favorite is Hipmunk, so that's what I use, and the server for the actual airline that's going to be responsible for operating the flight and making sure I have a seat on the flight. So remember that each of these is gonna be considered its own process. And as you can imagine, these processes have to be able to communicate with one another. So if we consider these three different processes within a distributed system, we can start to imagine how they'll have to talk to one another in order to communicate important pieces of information. For example, if I wanna buy a plane ticket for my flight to Medellin, I might log on to Hipmunk and go into my account and select the flight that I wanna buy. And then Hipmunk will take my request to buy a flight and actually send it to the airline and ask them to reserve a seat in my name. Obviously, they'll have to make sure, are there enough seats? And when is this flight? And a lot of like logistical details. Let's say that I end up getting a seat on this flight and the airline actually books me a seat. Well, then it has to tell Hipmunk that 
And it, Hipmunk needs to communicate that back to my process, my server, and tell me that, hey, you do have a seat. Have a great trip. And this is all fine, uh, except that every process has things happening within it that are happening within all of this communication. And there can be delays between sending and receiving and handling messages between these three processes. And to make matters worse, if you remember the example of the American Railroad, these processes are actually not ever really running on the exact same clock. So, in fact, this is an interesting tidbit, most systems end up running on slightly different times all the time. And we'll see how that happens in a moment, but you can imagine how this might be an issue. And all of this can lead to potentially disastrous situations. For example, what would happen if somehow the process that's handling the request for the airline was running on a slightly different clock than my server? And when, I, when the airline tried to book me on a flight, it recorded a time that was actually earlier than the time recorded on my server. By the time this information comes back to my server, you can imagine it's going to be a very tricky situation because the order of events makes no sense. And suddenly things are happening in the future that are impacting the past, and that seems very bad. Um, and obviously, you can imagine that our server would get very confused, and it would probably throw an error, and it would not be fun for me or the person that is debugging this. So problems like these are exactly what make distributed systems hard in general. And it's an important point to note. Distributed systems contain multiple processes which are often asynchronous in nature. And if we can start to wrap our heads around this concept, we'll start to see that the most important aspect of a distributed system isn't really the exact time of events, but rather the ordering of events in a distributed system. In order to understand how to handle and sequentially order things, we need to understand just how one process works first. So each process in every system has its own concept of what time it is, and what events have happened, and what it's aware of. In other words, every process kind of has its own snapshot of how it sees the world. Another phrase that you'll hear used interchangeably for this is its state. Every process has its own concept of state, which means it has its own concept of... Oh, no. Oh, that's better, okay. <laughs> it has its own process of, t uh, it has its own concept of state and it has its own concept of time. And it only knows certain events that it has seen. But wait, what exactly are these events that I keep talking about? Well, we've already seen the events in the ticket booking system that we looked at before. There are a few different possible events within a distributed system and if we think about our example, we'll recall that a process can pretty much do three different things. It can receive a message from elsewhere, from another process, but it can also send a message to another process. And the third thing that happens in between all of the sending and receiving is the instructions and events that happen within a process itself. So in a single process, you can order events Hello? Oh, good. This is going to be really fun for whoever's watching this on video. <laughs> OK. Um, OK, so yes, in a, in a single process, you can order events linearly, um, which is fine because there's only one thing happening at a time. But it's worth noting here that every process, you'll recall, has its own clock. And all of the events in a process have some sort of timestamp that's based on the local time that is associated with it. However, the moment that you have more than one process, which is gonna happen in a distributed system, you have a new problem, which is that things can't be ordered linearly. But it's still important for us to be able to know the time at which events happened, or at very minimum, the order of events and when they happened. Now, as if this wasn't hard enough, You'll recall that I said that different hardware clocks, different systems run on their own slightly different version of time. 
Well, this is something that's a known problem in distributed systems called drift. It turns out every computer's internal hardware clock can be thrown off by lots of different factors. There can be delays um, in sending messages and receiving them. There can be jitters um, and problems in the software. And also, just the environment of a machine can impact its clock ever so slightly. But that ever so slightly makes a huge difference when it comes to a distributed system. You might be familiar with something called NTP, or Network Time Protocol, which was actually created in the 1980s. But because it was created in the 1980s, it's a little outdated, and it can be problematic. NTP is the standard protocol for the transfer of time between computers, and it's used to synchronize computers onto the same time. The only problem is that it doesn't completely eliminate drift. It just kind of reduces it. So there's no guarantee that all the, all the different processes are going to be running on the same time. So this is basically like our railroad example, but possibly worse because people get mad when they can't book an airline ticket. So I think that the reason that time is so hard to reason about in general and what makes it a hard problem is because it's hard to know if one thing happened before another. So one of the solutions to this problem that we've already encountered is something called timestamps. And as it turns out, the concept of adding timestamps to the events in processes isn't a really entirely new thing. One of the earliest references to adding timestamps to messages came from a paper in 1975 that was called The Maintenance of Duplicate Databases by Paul Johnson and Bob Thomas. Now, if you haven't heard about this paper, don't worry. I hadn't yet either. And we're actually not going to go into it too much today. Um, but there's one reason that I wanted to bring it up, which is that this paper is interesting in that it influenced a major revolutionary way of thinking about time in distributed systems. So this paper ended up on the desk of this guy, which some of you may recognize him. Um, this is a computer, science, computer scientist named Leslie Lamport. Um, and this, the paper ended up on the desk of Le Leslie Lamport. And he saw it, and he read this algorithm for timestamps. And he realized that when he looked at the algorithm, there was actually an issue when it came to causality and the ordering of events. In other words, the algorithm that he read also didn't make any sense and didn't really clarify the ordering of events within a system. So Lamport took inspiration from that paper, and he wrote his own paper in 1978 called Time Clocks and the Ordering of Events in a Distributed System. This paper is one of the most widely cited in computer science history, and I definitely recommend reading it. Um, and Lamport ended up re uh, receiving a Turing Prize and a Dijkstra Prize uh, later in his career, partially because of his work on this. And this paper was generally very in instrumental, instrumental and influential um, for how we think about distributed systems and for the inter internet as a whole. At its core, it's a lot simpler than it sounds. So let's dig a little deeper into how it works. As we know, in a single system, you have one process with many different events. It's easy to see which events occurred before another, because you can see the instructions which happened before other ones. Within a single system, you only have one event that can happen, which is just an instruction. But the moment you have a distributed system, you have a different way of communicating altogether. Events don't just happen within a system. You can also send and receive communication, which is events in and of itself. And the added complication here is now things can be based on things that are happening in other systems. So now we have events that affect one another, as well as concurrent events across processes. And the problem here is that time isn't linear anymore. Some events could be happening at literally the exact time, exact same time as others. And interestingly, Lamport's paper kind of ignores time altogether. Instead, he says that what's more important isn't time, but figuring out when something happened and what happened before something else. 
And one of the phrases that he uses in this paper that he introduces is the idea of happened before, which he denotes with just an arrow. This is a pretty simple idea. Uh, if you look at this one process, P, we can see that event A happened before event B. If event A is sending a message and B is receiving it, then A happened before B. Similarly, if an event happens after another event and we follow the chain of events, we can see that if event A caused event B and B happened before C, then A had to have happened before C, just by pure logic. And if we look at happened before, we can start to determine the causal chain of events within a system. Looking at this, you know that A could affect C, even though just by looking at these processes, that might not be obvious if you didn't know the causal chain of events. Here's, an here's a diagram from, from the paper itself. You'll see that, um, for example, process P here at this point in time has no idea what's happening in process Q. The only time that it knows about process Q and what's going on in that process is when it receives a message from the other process. And if we use happen before, this idea of happen before, in order to determine the order of events, we can also follow the progress of time by tracing the process and message lines. This is something that Lamport calls causal paths, and it helps make causality of events so much more clear. For example, we can see in this model of processes that A happens before D, and D happens before E, but we also know that from this that A impacts E because A happens before D, which happens before E. Similarly, we can follow the causal path from event A all the way to event H. But back to timestamps. This is all fine, but we need to connect it back to timestamps because that's what this is all about. That's what we use. And we haven't answered that question just yet, but it's the same idea when it comes to following causality. Lamport's thesis in this paper is really that if you follow the idea of the happens before relationship with events and how they connect to each other, then your timestamps have to do the exact same thing. And the way that his algorithm worked was by creating something as simple as a counter, which he terms logical clocks. And sometimes these are also refer referred to as Lamport clocks. So he doesn't actually bother with time at all. He just says, I'm gonna create a counter and I'm just gonna increment it as events happen and I'll be able to follow the sequential order of these numbers as the counter grows to figure out what happened before something else. When every process starts, it initiates with a counter. And we're just assuming everything starts at the same time. That's another hard problem, but I don't have enough time to get into it today. Um, but let's just say every process starts with a counter at zero. When process P executes its first step, it knows that something about its state has changed. So it changes its clock and it increments its, its counter from zero to one. But around the same time, process R also has an event and it's sending a message elsewhere. So it's also going to increment its counter from zero to one. And because it's sending a message, it's going to send its version, its snapshot, its state, of the time in the message to whoever is receiving it. Looks like in this example, it's process Q that is receiving it. So it sends its message, it also sends its version of the time, its counter. Now, when process Q receives this message from process R, it takes this message and it thinks that its time, its counter, its clock is zero. But now it has a message that it has received that is one which is a different time. So how do you reconcile these two things? Well, when process Q receives this message, it looks at the two different times that it has, this zero and one, and it has to decide what to do. And because one process knows it's receiving something from elsewhere, it knows to consider that message and it looks at the zero of its own time, and it looks at the one from the message that's coming in, and it knows, hey, I'm supposed to receive this message. I'm gonna look at these two timestamps, and I'm gonna look at which one of these is larger, 
And that's the time I'm going to use because now I know I've progressed further in the causality of time. So process Q does the logical thing. It looks at the two values. It takes the larger of the two, which is the one that came from process R, and it chooses the bigger one since that's the most recent thing that happened. It increments its new clock number and it creates a receive event. So now process Q is more up to date once it's received information from another process in the system. And this ensures that the send event from process R is getting a timestamp that's actually smaller than the one that came from Q, which is how we can be sure that our timestamps and the logical counters that we're using, which is just numbers, nothing more complicated than that, actually obey causality. This algorithm ensures that any events that happen before process two, or event two in process Q, man, that's a mouthful. I should have named these, not P, Q, and R. Those are very hard. <laughs> um, it ensures that anything that happened before event two in process Q will still follow the order in terms of the logical clock and still connect back to the string of causal events. And if you read Lamport's paper, this is just a warning, there's a lot of formulas in there. Don't be frightened, because his algorithm's actually very simple. And it's funny, because if you watch videos of him, he says how simple it is, and I'm like, dude, that paper looks very hard. <laughs> You're a computer scientist. <laughs> um, <laughs> but his basic algorithm actually just works like this. Anytime anything happens in a process, any event, a message is sent, a message is received, or something happens inside of a process, the logical clock counter must be incremented. When a process is sending an event, it must send its own counter's value in the message itself. And when a process is received in, or when, when a process receives an event, it will look at its own snapshot version state, whatever you want to call it. It's going to look at its own version of the time and look at the clock counter that was sent with the message and consider the larger one of the two and increment it and create a new receive event. That's pretty much it. Look at the larger number, increment it by one, acknowledge the receive event. And that's the entire algorithm. All of it is just his solution, Leslie Lamport's solution to maintaining the order of events. Now, one problem, one slight problem, which is that if you start reading his algorithm, you will notice that causality and concurrency are actually very hard to separate. And I'm not gonna get too much into it today, but Leslie Lamport, just like someone else inspired him, his work inspired the creation and helped create something else called vector clocks, which is a little bit like these Lamport clocks, but with some added complexity. And they actually do solve the problem of differentiating causality from concurrency. So look them up, Google them, they're very cool. Um, maybe I'll give a talk on them someday. So I think the real thesis of Lamport's paper was that nobody knows what time it is, but maybe that's actually okay, because we don't really care so much about what time it is, but more when things happened and how other things impacted one another. If we can understand and wrap our heads around how that works, we can start to reconstruct the order of events in a single process or within a massive distributed system. And if we can understand the simple ways in which we can get around these hard problems and just simplify them to get the job done, our life suddenly becomes a lot easier. So, if you are interested in how things work, or if you enjoy breaking things and understanding how things work under the hood, or you like learning computer science, or nerding out about computer science papers, um, you might like a project that I recently worked on called BaseCS. Um, it is a written blog series that explores the fundamentals of computer science, and it does it in a very fun and friendly, non-scary way. Um, and there's also a podcast and a video series that has started, um, which is really fun. So if you don't enjoy learning by reading long blog posts, there's something hopefully else that's there for you. Um, and I also have some podcast stickers with me today. So if you'd like one, come find me afterwards. You can learn a lot more about all of this at basecs.org. And I really hope that you feel more empowered to understand 
how these complex systems work, and you'll see the beauty in the simplicity and the elegant solutions that people have used and have helped and benefited all of us um, and that we continue to use today. Hopefully you'll see they're not nearly as intimidating as they might seem. Gracias. <laughs>